Hey everyone, I am Alicia Cross and I am now live on Instagram. Thank you if you're watching on YouTube. Today I'm going to be talking about um, Pelosi porn and prejudice, but I'll get to that in just a second. First, I wanted to ask you to please go to my YouTube channel and subscribe. Be sure to comment and share too, because I love talking with people there and uh, getting your feedback, whether you agree or disagree with me. I appreciate that. Uh, of course, today, the story that is still trending, especially after Speaker Nancy Pelosi's press conference yesterday in which she blamed the single mom salon shop owner for a setup for her going to get a wash and a blowout, uh, is Nancy Pelosi. I think of the there was a New York Times reporter that said yesterday of the top 25 stories trending on Facebook yesterday Pelosi was the topic of 13 of them and I'm glad to see a lot of outlets covering this because I think that it should be covered and I think it, there should just be consistency across the board that if you're going to be someone that criticizes President Trump or Vice President President Mike Pence for going out and to public places and not adhering to rules and not wearing masks and talking about the importance of political leaders to do so, which I've seen a lot of commentators talking about for months now, uh, then you need to rightfully criticize Nancy Pelosi. Here's the deal. I miss dry bar. I miss getting my hair done. I tried to do my hair in rollers all the time. I'm, I'm kind of a tomboy when it comes to hair and makeup. Uh, Jess has tried to teach me everything that she can. So is my hair girl, Lisa, who is awesome, who I'd never throw under the bus because I've been going to her for more than seven years. <laughs> um, and I think that Nancy Pelosi should a thousand percent be able to go get her hair done if she wants to be able to get her hair done. Uh, I, she is older, so therefore I think that she's at risk, even though she seems pretty wiry and healthy. So if I were her, I would have worn a mask in an indoor place where there's recirculated air, especially because the job that she holds, she's around a lot of other people. So in turn, she exposed her hairstylist to potential dangers and potential germs that he might not have had before. Um, but if she wants to go get her hair done, if you want to go get your hair done, I'm a thousand percent okay with reopening the economy and people being able to go and get their hair done. The problem is, is the hypocrisy of people like Nancy Pelosi and, and Gavin Newsom and Andrew Cuomo and Bill de Blasio, who likes to go to the gym, even though he shut it down for everybody else, is that it's the do as they say, not as they do. And I despise this when it happens on both sides of the aisle, but I think we're really seeing it more from the American left than we are on uh, people on the right right now. We're seeing a growing level of do as I say, not as I do. And I think Nancy really missed an opportunity to say, you know what, I screwed up. I'm part of the reopen California effort now. Uh, but no, instead she feigned stupidity, even though she's lives in the Bay Area, which is one of the areas that has been the most locked down, some of the earliest cities and area and suburban areas to lock down way back in March, even I think before Los Angeles, where I live, did. And she's pretending that she doesn't know about the mask mandate and she doesn't know that indoor salons aren't supposed to be open, which I think is BS, by the way. I think if a small business owner wants to be open, they should be open and they could adhere to their own rules. I actually participated in a poll the other day that was so dumb and and it, it reveals to me how much California needs to change because something like 53% of people thought that both the store owner and the person that refused to wear a mask, like if they didn't have mask enforcement, should be charged, should like be ticketed by law enforcement. And I was like, this is such a laugh coming from the people that want to, on one hand, defund the police and minimize the uh, level of impact that law enforcement has in the United States and in our cities. But then on the other hand, they want people to, they want cops to be out there policing whether or not small businesses are adhering to CDC guidelines or individual shoppers like myself are wearing masks. Anyway, I think that Pelosi really missed an opportunity. I think it was super tacky that she decided to throw the salon owner and her hairdresser under the bus. There are now conflicting reports from her team, the, the guy that did her hair, who apparently she's been going to for years and she just like, see ya. Um, and then the salon owner who Nancy Pelosi said it was a total setup. Uh, it sounds like my three-year-old when she's making <laughs> excuses for disobeying, like, oh, I didn't mean to, my sister did it. Uh, th this is what Nancy Pelosi did and she should know better. I mean, it, it really is, even if it was, like seriously, even if it was a setup and that she fell for, she's still being hypocritical in going and doing this, right? Like she's still saying what is for you guys is not what's for me. And I was just caught and now I'm sorry. Uh, I just think it's in bad taste. I think that there's a lot of people that need and want to get back to work. I drive down parts of LA, like down Wilshire Boulevard or downtown LA, um, 
and the juxtaposition of places that are, you know, only at half capacity or places that are boarded up and never coming back. It's this, it's actually kind of depressing. I've said this to friends and family that it's this weird level of like kind of open, but not back to normal. And I don't think that we're going to ever get back to normal. And I think that there's increasing studies that are showing like maybe we should have never locked down in the first place. Uh, there's increasing studies showing that, that the suicidality and suicidal thoughts of people is increasing because of the isolation and they're only doing things like watching YouTube and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and they're seeing all the vitriol there. Like people need human connection. People need church. People need, you know, dinner parties. People need schools. People need to be able to go to dry bar and get their hair done and feel good about themselves and then go on a girl's night. And I am a thousand percent okay with people doing that. I'm okay with Nancy Pelosi doing that. What I'm not okay with is the lies about it and the do as I say, not as I do about it. Which leads me to another conversation, which is the explicit prejudice and the prejudice, you know, definition of prejudice. I don't have any notes, by the way, when I do this because I am doing it live and I'm just looking at my iPhone and the camera. But the definition of prejudice is having an opinion without any, without like, any proof, right? It's a bias without any proof. And Kamala Harris has proven throughout her career that she will show prejudice or she will show bias in a situation if it is politically convenient for her. Um, she did this during the Kavanaugh hearings, right? Where she shouted, you know, believe all women and accused Brett Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, of things that there was literally no evidence for. And yet, when it comes to the situation in Kenosha, she's done interview after interview in which she says, without any of the evidence being gathered, which is really scary that this woman was a prosecutor and the, you know, the top cop of the state of California, without any evidence coming in, she in insists that the riots and the protests and Jacob Blake are 100% innocent and there was no reason for the cops to be there and there's no reason for the cops to shoot him. Um, I'm waiting for all of the evidence of the case and it is interesting that you see the prejudice of Kamala Harris here and the political expediency of her saying, hmm, I'm going to side with this guy and I'm going to make help make him a national hero, despite the fact that he was going against a restraining order. This is according to the 911 tape and a victim in which in May he he digitally raped while her child was sitting in bed next to her. So I have a hard time believing someone like a Kamala Harris who says we are supposed to believe all women and that women do not make up allegations of sexual assault. And yet she is now saying, oh, hey, you know, we should not listen to this woman. Didn't even acknowledge that the reason why the cops were there in the first place is that he was going against a restraining order and had taken the keys away from the victim while his kids are in the car. I mean, it's disturbing on all counts. And my mama always says there's two sides to every story and the truth. And I think here we have multiple sides, right? We have the side of the of Blake himself. We have the side of um, the victim here is who is the one that called 911. And we ha have the sides of the police officers that are involved. And I just want all of the facts to come in. And I just think it's wrong for someone like Kamala Harris, who claims to be for peace, who claims to be for justice, and who in the past has said to believe all women is now not believing the victim uh, of this guy, this alleged victim uh, of this guy. And which, which kind of rolls me into two other stories that we've seen in the last week and the explicit bias of people like Kamala and their inability to kind of connect the dots of the dangers um, of pornography. The feminist movement as a whole says that pornography is okay because the women involved are totally fine with it. They're getting paid for their labor. We've seen a celebration of sex workers, right? We've uh, seen a celebration of women exposing their bodies. Women like Emily, Rad Emily Ratajkowski who goes to, you know, march for Planned Parenthood topless because apparently showing your tatas is supposed to be some liberating thing for women. Um, and so even when they celebrate the explicit sexualization of women's bodies as objects and say that uh, we should allow women and celebrate women that do this, we haven't seen a recognition of how dangerous pornography is for our culture and how it leads to the further objectification and I think the eventual abuse of women. There was a film years ago that my husband and I were a part of promoting because we did a lot of um, volunteer work for an anti-sex trafficking charity when we lived in New York City. We have friends that are involved in Rescue Freedom. It's an incredible organization that you guys should check out. And this film is called Sex and Money. And in this film, it interviewed everybody from 
um, you know, I think Brownback, who was the governor of Kansas at the time, to people like Cornell West, who I don't often agree with, um, especially politically, but it had a wide range of interviews, a wide range of topics, and a wide range of statistics and a discussion around the dangers of pornography and how it eventually leads to, and that addiction eventually leads to the further, um, I guess, downfall of something, watching something. There was a TED talk about this years ago about what pornography does to the brain and the addictive kind of personality that it feeds into, especially in young men um, with their prefrontal cortex not being completely developed and all these things. And it has the same kind of addiction and need to re-up and increase that level of interest or that level of um, like intensity. I feel like I'm not using the right words right now, but it's like not, like they the foray into one thing, it's like a gateway drug, and then they go into something deeper, and then they go into something grittier, and then they go into, you know, I don't know, a little BDSM, and then it goes and goes and goes. And the downfall of what was normalized in their minds then unfortunately leads to further addiction and sometimes even abuse. But a lot of people and a lot of feminists don't want to address this. And I think that that is a huge problem. I think it's a problem for society as a whole. And you have people like Bethany Mandel, uh, saying, oh, hey, are we really surprised then that Ron Jeremy now has 27 counts uh, from, I think, 17 different victims against him between the ages of 15 and 54? And I think that we haven't seen this in the news, and it's horrifying. Uh, the counts against him are, are disgusting. They make my skin crawl. They um, re-up my belief in the importance of the death penalty because some guys should just get the death penalty for the awful things that they do to women and children, in my opinion. Um, they should not, they, there's a judicial system that they can appeal. Um, and that is, I guess their constitutional right, but it's a good thing. I'm not a judge because I would want it to be immediate and swift and let the victims be there to see the end of their acute, like their attacker. The things against him are disgusting. Um, the charges against him are disgusting, but yet how are we supposed to be surprised? when someone like him was previously applauded and praised and seen as a revolutionary and the first of his time in the porn industry um, and surrounded in an industry in which he thinks that he should get his way or it's apparent that his real life was duplicating the disgusting things that he was creating on screen. And I think that it is dangerous for society as a whole and I think it's disgusting how this story about him and the correlation between his real life and what happened on screen and his job um, are not being addressed. And that those risks that that poses to women and girls is not being addressed. So those are the things I've just been thinking about this week and wanted to rant about them a little bit. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, comment and share, and I will see you guys soon.